It's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you uh, to the inaugural lecture of the Simon Initiative, which uh, CMU just announced a little more than two months ago. And I cannot think of somebody more accomplished and more qualified to deliver the inaugural lecture uh, than uh, Dr. Carl Wyman, uh, who is currently professor of physics and professor of education at uh, Stanford University. Now, the Simon Initiative uh, was very carefully named after CMU's own Herb Simon, whose work over many, many decades right here has influenced the thinking on campus on how to bring in the latest in technology, and even before the technology becomes popular, how do we make sure that we take the latest in technology, define the cutting edge of the technology, so that it also brings in the human element in the most appropriate way to have the maximum impact and output. In the context of education and learning, and Simon had such a profound impact on uh, the way in which basic research, which is scientifically grounded and evidence-based, um, is, is done, conducted uh, in the most rigorous way possible so that we can benefit from it as we employ technology. In the context of education, it is so critical as access to information has become so widespread all over the world. And in my own thinking, as I started to meet with large numbers of faculty on campus since uh, summer of last year, I was thinking about how to frame uh, CMU's unique, uh, not only aspirations, but set of accomplishments over many decades. We have an opportunity to first consider the individual in the context of scaling. How do we take an individual with very different backgrounds, different individuals with very different backgrounds, how do we employ the technology so that those individuals can maximize and optimize the learning outcome for themselves? So somebody who is highly accomplished with the right background, right, um, right prior uh, knowledge of the field, how can they learn as quickly as possible using technology? At the same time, somebody coming from an underprivileged background uh, for, or may have some learning disability, how do we make sure that they also have access to the latest technology in the right possible way? So individual by individual, how do we employ technology so that it has the maximum output outcome? That's one goal. If we can do that for tens of millions of individuals simultaneously across national borders and institutional borders, that's even a great, greater outcome. So that's sort of the, uh, the, the spirit behind this. At a local level on campus, at the national level to create a dialogue through the Global Learning Council, and at the global level, uh, to bring together uh, learners and teachers uh, so that we can develop best practices, metrics, and eventually the ingredients of standards that will have global impact. And we cannot have, uh, we could not have asked for um, uh, a better group than the 12 members who have joined the Global Learning Council as part and parcel of this, this vision that we now call uh, Simon Initiative on campus. And one of the members of the Global Learning Council is also Dr. Carl Wyman. Now, Simon, um, in his work in many different disciplines on campus, from business to economics to policy to computer science to machine learning to psychology, has had such a profound effect. And uh, he, uh, of course, was recognized in 1978 with a Nobel Prize uh, in economics and we thought it would be most fitting to name this initiative uh, after him. Now, I had the pleasure and privilege of uh, working with Carl Wyman uh, for the last three years in Washington when I was director of the National Science Foundation. Carl came roughly at the same time as the associate director in the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House uh, in charge of education and research. In that capacity, we had an opportunity to interact on many, many occasions, and we had a standing dinner once a, once a month, so we tried out different restaurants in Washington, D.C., and we had an opportunity to talk about a lot of things. So you may know that uh, Carl, with the two of his uh, two, two colleagues, uh, received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2001, 
It very rarely happens this way, but uh, it turns out that all three of them are good friends of mine. And <laughs> <laughs> Eric Carnell worked with Carl um, at Gila in Colorado, uh, was a co-winner, and Eric was an advisor to me at the National Science Foundation. Wolfgang Ketterle was a colleague of mine in physics from MIT, and just last week in Davos, I bumped into Wolfgang four times, and uh, he was also at the CMU reception uh, in uh, Davos. And Carl, um, of course, uh, shared this prize. For those who are not in physics, uh, the, 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 the official citation is given here for the achievement of Bose-Einstein condensation in dilute gases of alkali atoms and for early fundamental studies of the properties of the condensates. So let me translate that into English. And Carl received the Nobel Prize for what are called ultra-cold atoms. And uh, what, uh, so we've been thinking about a way to invite him to come here for the inaugural lecture. And the best time to invite him <laughs> is when we have an Arctic <laughs> vortex. And, uh, so I, I'm, we, we had an impeccable timing. So I hope you noticed that call. Um, so call is also, I talked about Arctic vortex, but call and I also shared another experience in another cold climate. There is a theme associated with call. His research was in cold atoms. He comes here with, uh, at the coldest time of the year. So this is a picture of me and call standing in Antarctica in uh, the week before Thanksgiving in 2011, on our way to the South Pole. And, uh, and we arrived at the South Pole together. The day we were there, the temperature was minus 64 degrees. And it doesn't matter whether it's Celsius or Fahrenheit. <laughs> the, 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 the effect is the same, and it, it's pretty cold. It doesn't matter whether it's Kelvin either, right? <laughs> um, so this is in Scott Base, which belongs to uh, New Zealand. And you can see the latitude there. This is north of the South Pole, 77.51 degree latitude south. And this is in a place called McMurdo, which is part of the US uh, station, research station in Antarctica. This is our travel group. Uh, so here is Carl, and that's me. And this is the director of the US Geological Survey. Deputy, Deputy uh, Administrator of NASA, and my staff member from the National Science Foundation. This is the plane that takes us to the South Pole. So Carl is very fond of cold climates. So that's, that's what I wanted to tell you. The other major contribution, in addition to his many scientific and intellectual contributions, Carl has had a huge impact, at least uh, the time that I overlapped with him in Washington, this is a report, even though we both uh, co-chaired the National Science and Technology Council Committee on co STEM education, Carl was the driving force behind producing this report, which for the first time through the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy brought together an inventory of what the US is spending on STEM education policies. And uh, this was a report that has had a lot of impact on Congress, and he was the main driving force behind it. I'll just close with uh, two slides. Uh, in recognition, so in the last 10 years, he has focused uh, his, uh, most of his energy in uh, education, especially STEM education. Um, and the University of British Columbia uh, in Vancouver established the Carl Wyman Science Education Initiative uh, in his honor that he led uh, until he came to Washington. And uh, this is an institute, and you can see achieving the most effective evidence-based science education, effective science education backed by evidence. And uh, this is essentially the spirit behind the uh, Simon Initiative, and that's why we couldn't ask for a better uh, inaugural lecturer than Dr. Carl Wyman. So with that, Carl, I would like to invite you to give your lecture, taking a scientific approach to science education. Uh, thank you. It's a it's a pleasure to be here, and you know I have I have to say uh, one of my probably the high point, or depending on your geographical orientation, low point, uh, but still best part of. 
being uh, in Washington was the trip to Antarctica and the South Pole with Subra. And I, I was going to use my pictures there, but uh, <laughs> I don't have to. He had them already. Uh, so I'll just say, you know, it's a particular pleasure to have this be the uh, lecture launching the Simon Initiative because uh, while I won't go in detail every time uh, showing all Herb Simon's uh, contributions. In fact, the work he did is really the underpinnings of pretty much all the stuff I'm going to be talking about today. And so he, he really started this whole area. So uh, I'm going to be talking about scientific approach to science education. And you know, this is motivated by the, and has the goal really to have uh, all students, whether, whatever career they're going into, uh, to be able to, to think about and use science more like scientists do. And I think, you know, you have all kinds of economic and basically uh, societal reasons why we need to uh, achieve that. Now, before I get into, uh, you know, the details of the of the scientific approach to that, I want to just kind of whet your appetite with some data, you know, and, and show you an example here. So this is looking at an experiment, measuring the amount of learning that actually takes place in class. And so it's a comparison between two, you know, real, uh, normal, large classes, uh, uh, 250 student sections teaching physics, and where they're covering an identical set of learning objectives and an identical amount of class time, and then both groups have the same test uh, right at the end of this. And it's a comparison of the results between uh, two different instructors. One of these was a, a very experienced uh, professor teaching this many times, used high student ratings, but used a basically traditional lecture approach the other was a person who had a PhD in physics, but a newly minted PhD, so little experience in teaching, but had been trained in the principles of effective teaching that I'm going to talk about uh, today in my talk. So what was the outcome between the two groups? Well, it's, it's this histogram here. So the, this is the score, the histogram of number of students versus the score on this common exam. and so. The red here is the results from the highly rated but traditional teacher, where I should point out random guessing gives you three on this. So you can see how much learning was accomplished in that class versus the one using these research-based methods in, the, in white. And so you know, this is a starting point to convince you maybe this is worth paying attention to. Obviously, something's very different happening between these two cases. And we'll come back to some details on this. But, but all this really comes about because of, uh, like, starting with the work of her assignment, but now uh, major advances, particularly in the past couple of decades, from three different fields, uh, cognitive psychology, you know, mostly work in labs, studying how people think and learn, studies of the brain, and, and then studies in classrooms, primarily university uh, science and engineering classrooms. And what's coming out of all of these fields is, is a, a very consistent um, guidance or understanding and principles for what's needed to achieve uh, learning of complex things like uh, science. And, and these principles then are sort of, you know, guiding what we do. But before I go into showing you some of those results and, and what we're learning from these fields, I want to give you a sense of, of my perspective on this, how I got into thinking about this my own way. And starting with the way I started teaching when I was a new faculty member, you know, I was supposed to teach uh, introductory physics, and so I used what I think is the natural human reaction when you're called upon to teach anything to anybody, 
as I, you know, thought about the material very carefully and got it all figured out in my own mind so that then I could go and explain it to the students so they would understand it the same way I did. And then I give them some problem to solve. If the ones who do it, great, I was successful. Um, if they couldn't do the problem, well, there must be something wrong with those students because, you know, I clearly understood it and just explained it to them, right? Now, you know, some teachers figure, well, the students are just hopeless in that case, just get rid of them, and that happens to lots of students. But, you know, others are like me. I was nicer, so I would try telling them again louder <laughs> with the hope this would be more effective. Now, I've, if nothing else, always been a very hardcore experimentalist. I measure, believe in measurement, measuring results. And, you know, whenever I would make an effort to really understand how students were learning and thinking, it was clear to me that my brilliantly clear explanations were in fact leaving most of the students uh, quite baffled. And, you know, but I did a few tests with some of my uh, colleagues, students, and they weren't doing any better. So, you know, this was just seemed like a kind of unfortunate fact of life, frustrating, but that's the way it was. You couldn't do much better. Now, but my enlightenment of this didn't come through teaching in the, in the formal sense. It actually came through my research work of, as Sue, you know, alluded to, I had a substantial atomic physics program over many years, worked closely with lots of graduate students. And I came to see there was a curious pattern that emerged. So the first was that, well, pretty much all these students, they didn't get into my lab unless they'd had, you know, many years of spectacular success in coursework, particularly physics coursework. But in spite of that, pretty much universally, and put into the lab to do research, they were pretty clueless about what to do. But that was only, you know, that wasn't maybe so surprising. What was really surprising is consistently, though, after a couple of years of working in the research lab, they had turned into expert physicists. Now, you know, the first few times I saw this happening, um, you no, know, well, I thought it was just kind of the idiosyncrasies of those students. But after enough years and enough students, I came to say, this is really quite a consistent pattern. There had to be some underlying reason for this. Uh, you know, that there's a, there's a fundamental puzzle about learning involved here. Now, you know, first hypothesis was, you know, you know that occurs to me, and lots of people have seen this as well, maybe the human brain, it just needs sort of to go through sort of like a 17 year caterpillar stage before it can <laughs> blossom into a physicist butterfly. But I took a little more scholarly approach to seeing if that was really true. And so I dug into research on how people learn, including some of Herb Simon's work, and particularly how they learn physics. And from that, I came to see that in fact, uh, the, this wasn't a puzzle at all. If you look at the research, it completely explained why this was happening. Um, and it gave me a completely different way to think about learning. And it showed how we can really do much better in how we teach our classes, particularly college science classes. And so, you know, that's what I'm gonna tell you about starting with sort of the, the highest level picture of this, of really the whole paradigm on, on learning of complex tasks, with the research is really telling us uh, to, and we have to think about it in a new way. And then the, the old way, and it's really the way I used to think about, and unfortunately still reflected in most of the current teaching, is that you know, we have coming into our classrooms these brains, and they have variations in them. We, immerse them in knowledge, in our teaching, and it soaks in the variable amounts depending on how that brain started. But what the research is telling us, the new paradigm, is really that these brains come into our classrooms not being all that different, and really they transform, actually change through 
suitable exercise, and to the extent their brains are doing, they're going the same kind of exercise, they can all change in much the same way. And that's really what learning is about. So next I want to sort of dig down a little more deeply into this is, you know, I talk about learning. What is it that we really want students to learn? When I say I want them to think, you know, more like a scientist d does, you know, and obviously they're not going to become expert scientists, but move in that direction of thinking more like a scientist, what does that really mean? Okay. And then what do we know about how it's learned? And then look at some data from classrooms testing these uh, ideas. So the first is, you know, what does it mean to think like a scientist? Or what does it mean to actually to think like um, an expert in any field? And this is where Herm Simon did much of the pioneering work, but cognitive psychologists over the years have advanced this a long ways. And they've learned a great deal about the characteristics, the nature of expertise, and how that expertise is, is acquired. And it turns out, they found, it's quite consistent over many, many different human endeavors. So expertise, or expert competence, has three basic components, sort of universally. Uh, the first one, everybody could guess. Experts in their a field have a, know a whole lot of information about that field. The others aren't so obvious, uh, and in some ways more important from an educational standpoint. The, the second is that experts in any, any specific field, they have a particular uh, organizational framework by which they, you know, mentally they organize all this information, and this organizational framework of, of the discipline makes it much more effective allows them to be much more effective at deciding which of in that information is useful and applying it uh, quickly and effectively. And, and these kind of mental organizational frameworks are involved, you know, looking for and recognizing certain uh, complex patterns and relationships. And most of what we talk about of scientific concepts is the way scientists in a given field to have a whole bunch of different pieces of, of information that they organize together and so that they can see, oh yeah, this is going to be useful or not. And it's a great filter for dealing with uh, use of, of knowledge. Then the third uh, general characteristic of expertise is experts in, in working in their field are always able to actually analyze their own thinking. So if a person, an expert is working on a problem, they're, they're continually sort of running this background testing, ask, questioning of, do I understand this? Is this really a sensible way to be solving this problem? And they have resources that they're calling upon that can actually answer those questions and then guide changes accordingly to be uh, effective problem solving. Now, what the research tells us is uh, all of these, but you know, I want to focus particularly on these two, um, are fundamentally new ways of thinking. No human brain, you know, starts out having these in any area of endeavor. And what research shows is that everyone requires many hours um, of intense practice to develop these and actually to get to a high level of expertise. It's, it, it's, seems pretty universal, requiring many thousands of hours. And nowadays, I think it's becoming quite clear that, that you know, the reason for this is fundamentally biological, that in the, this, to have this kind of expertise, you have to basically substantially change the brain. You've got to change the wiring in the brain. And you know, it just takes a lot of time and exercise to get the brain to work through to do that. Now, the next uh, aspect of, of one of the general learning about expertise is not just the, the general characteristics. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, okay, so, sorry, back to my train of, capture my train of thought. So, saying it takes these many thousand hours of intense practice, but it's not just any kind of practice, very specific kinds of practice are needed. Uh, the learner 
has to be tackling uh, challenging but not impossible tasks or problems. You know, things that are hard exercise their brain strenuously, but they can still make progress on them. And those tasks have to be very explicitly practicing the expert thinking tasks uh, or activities that you know, make up expertise in that discipline. And there has to be guiding feedback from you know, presumably a coach or a teacher on what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, how to get better. And so, you know, these are the basic components and the evidence is that, okay, you just do this, keep getting better and better, so you can work and do more and more difficult uh, but possible problems. And after about 10,000 hours, most people in most subject, is what the research would suggest, can reach sort of a world-class level of uh, expertise. But in the process, and I want to emphasize this because it's important for thinking about teaching, they have quite a different brain than what they started out as. Uh, so what's the, how does the teacher come into this? Well, I think the best way to think about this is in a, an effective teacher is really so like a coach, but in a cognitive sense. And so what the what a, a effective teacher really has to do is first really think carefully about what makes up expertise in this subject, and then what's a good practice activity that will have that's appropriate for the learner and have them quite explicitly practicing that kind of expertise. And then the teacher has to give them good Good feedback, and good means both specific, you know, here's what you're doing right, here's how, what you need to get better, and timely, so it immediately can change uh, their functioning. And then finally, this requires, you know, this kind of learning expertise, it requires a lot of hard work. It's inherent, and so, so the, um, a good teacher also, like a good coach, really has to worry about motivation, to how to convince you know, these novice students who don't know anything about a subject, obviously, and therefore can't really be expected to, to appreciate why they should put an enormous amount of work into mastering this subject. That's the job of the teacher, to show them why this is a valuable, useful, you know, relevant thing to learn and therefore worth this investment of effort uh, to master it. Now, I want to just emphasize, if you think about these requirements, they really inherently require a great deal of expertise in the discipline. And in fact, they require a great deal more expertise than it does to get up and lecture on the subject. Okay? And so, in, in some sense, I see this as the fundamental justification of research universities. It's where you have the expertise, and therefore you have the potential to do the most effective job of teaching that expertise to others. On the other hand, that also makes it, you know, you know, research universities need to think about the responsibility that comes to that to make sure that they are teaching in a way that best takes, the, utilizes and transfers the expertise of the faculty. Okay, so I wanna, so these, basic principles and activities, they've played out in, um, you know, people have then studied how to implement them in particular subjects and particular levels and, and doing testing and comparison of these, usually comparisons with the traditional lecture approach to teaching. And there's actually a remarkable amount of research published on this. I, I uh, you know, my last review about a year ago, I turned up about a thousand research studies on this in undergraduate uh, science and engineering, and where showing that teaching methods that utilize these principles that I talked about consistently show greater learning and greater student success and things like lower failure rates. And so I'm just gonna run quickly through a few of what, you know, three of the thousand examples sort of to, to uh, illustrate this to you. Um, so the first one looks at 
conceptual mastery. By that, and this is an area that's been studied a lot in physics education research. And what I mean by conceptual mastery, I mean you come, you test if the students and put in some new situation, you know, examining some new situation can recognize uh, what physics concepts correctly apply to make meaningful predictions about the behavior in that system, okay? And so there's been a lot of work developing some good tests that cover areas of physics that allow you to see how students are developing that mastery. And so the, the oldest and most widely used is something called the, the force concepts inventory. And it takes a, a little subset of the basic concepts of force and motion that are covered in every first semester physics class and gives simple real world applications like cars running into trucks and then sees if students can correctly uh, predict the behavior there by applying the right concepts, applying them like a physicist would. Um, and the way these, this is used a lot is you, you give this test to the students uh, at the beginning of the semester and then you give it to them at the end after they've completed the course covering this and you look at, okay, what fraction of these, uh, you know, what fraction did they, of things they didn't know at the beginning could they do right at the end? And these are, you know, key essential concepts of the material. So the classes are looking at these very directly that really you'd expect all students should learn them. Um, so this is used a great deal and it, and it shows a very uh, profound result. Namely, if I look at this sort of percent didn't know that they actually learned, and I take the average of that over all the students in the class, um, it turns out that in a traditional lecture class that learning gain never exceeds 0.3. In other words, the, the average student in the class didn't learn uh, as much as a third of these essential concepts that they didn't already know when the course started. And this is just one published compilation of 16 of these, whereas I have data from many, many others that look, look much the same. The, the reason this is so compelling is that you know, this, this data and the other data I have includes courses of, you know, wildly varying class sizes, different types of institutions. There's Harvard University and a community college in there. Um, and different, uh, you know, ratings of how good the lecture is. So, and we got other data from now from other levels and other subjects, really just painting a compelling picture that this traditional lecture approach is just not an effective way to achieve conceptual mastery. On the other hand, we also have lots of data now showing that, and particularly for, for this material and using this test, basically there are materials now that people are pretty much standardly have well tested and faculty just kind of picking up, adopt, you know, applying in their classrooms and they pretty consistently get up into this range. So over a factor of two uh, improvement in student uh, learning conceptual mastery. Uh, now, another study that one of my favorites is, uh, comes from Cal Poly, and it again is looking at another uh, uh, sort of a similar type of test of conceptual mastery first year physics, but the reason I particularly like this is it addresses the issue of, you know, well, maybe in that data I showed you, then the people adopted, those are just the, the special faculty who, you know, had some special abilities and they took to use these techniques. In this study, they had a whole bunch of uh, sections and a whole bunch of faculty, included much of the department, and they basically just changed how all of them Taught. They had a powerful dean, what can I say? Um, so, started out, they collected data on this conceptual mastery over a number of years, and, and this was a different test, but the average faculty member was getting a bit under 0.3, which again is quite good for a traditional lecture approaches as they were using. And then they switched to a different teaching method, labeled the studio approach, but what this was was 
you know, all the students, instead of listening to lectures, all the students had a, a set of, of carefully developed, uh, by the physics education researchers, carefully developed set of, of tasks, problems that they worked on in small groups and and the faculty were then facilitators as of them working together on this. And so, what kind of results did they get after all the faculty switched to that? Well, so here's, here's the results. The learning gains now are up here, just a factor of two beyond, above their previous average. And there's a couple of things also that are quite striking about this. In fact, all the faculty are now the same. You see variations here, but in fact, you know, these are 30 student classes. You do a more detailed statistical analysis. There's no statistical difference between any of the faculty here. They're all teaching with essentially equal um, effectiveness. And it, this, again, sort of really emphasized the point that it's really the mental activities of the students that affect the learning, and because the students in this structure are doing much the same kind of mental processing, they're also achieving much the same learning. And it shows that basically every faculty member can now be highly effective using the right teaching practices, but it, you know, it, it's, this data is also really striking to see, you know, a, how much better a given faculty can make depending on what teaching practices they use. And I look at at this particular one here, okay, so they were getting down here a little below 0.1, and now they're up at 0 0.6. So, so that teach, that family member, they just changed their teaching methods, and their students learned a factor of six more. So that's really compelling to me, and I always wonder how university administrators can look at that and say, well, gosh, it's okay if our faculty are using the methods like this. Uh, you know, it's not our job to make them change. So, not to put you on the spot or anything. So. <laughs> okay, um, those are, uh, here's, you know, those are measures of, of, of learning and, you know, particular kind of expert learning. You can also look at things like uh, failures and, and dropout rates. And here's work from a uh, different field, computer science at uh, Beth Simons, work at University of California at San Diego. And so she took, and this again involves a number of instructors. I think there are five different ones involved in here, teaching sort of their base foundational four courses here and looking at the um, looking at the failure and dropout rates and I particularly like computer science because it's you know it's pretty darn well defined so it's pretty easy to make sure your tests year to year are really you know testing the same thing consistently uh, and so but they introduced what's called one of these methods called peer instruction which is basically the the class operates by the around the instructor posing a set of questions, you know, posing questions to the student. The students have clickers, they, they answer them individually, then they have to talk in small groups about the, the question, what the answer is and why, and re-answer, uh, again, using clickers. And so Beth had these multiple instructors uh, employ this, and the green then shows the, the resulting failure and dropout rates when they introduced this different way of teaching the material. And the average across these classes is now about a third of what it was. And if you think about, gee, University of California, San Diego, this is a whole lot of students here who are now, you know, being successful in this class, going on to be successful careers that could well have, you know, switched out of switched to different fields or dropped out of college entirely because of the, their failures. Okay, so the, the final example I'm gonna use is getting back to the one I, the data I started out with. And that, first make the, the point that these examples I gave here are, and really quite appropriately and most meaningful, are measuring things that the result of the entire class, you know, beginning to end, involving what happens in the classroom, exams, studying for exams, homework, et cetera. There's a whole lot of learning going on in those, in those sorts of 
outside classroom activities, but because faculty spend so much of their time when they're thinking about teaching and the evaluation is so focused on what happens in the classroom, we want to do a little, uh, just a little research experiment checking on, well, how much learning really takes place in the classroom and how dependent is that on what methods of teaching are used in the classroom. So this study was, was quite specifically designed to focus only on that classroom uh, learning. And so uh, it basically then took, there's a giant course that had multiple 250 student sections. This was the introductory physics for engineering students. And uh, so now, you know, this was in a great big lecture hall here. So just to show you, this isn't just class, small class kind of things you can do. And the comparison that I mentioned before, the control group was this experienced faculty member, and the experimental group was this postdoc trained to use these principles and approaches I've been talking about. Um, and as I said at the beginning, had exactly the same set of learning objectives they'd agreed on to be covered in the same amount of class time. That was also something people haven't been too careful in studying these things, and there's a worry you won't be able to cover as much material, so we made sure they're going to cover exactly the same stuff, testing on this exam they jointly uh, developed. And that was given, so they, this was to be covered in one week of class periods, carefully chosen, so right after they'd finished an exam and, and a homework assignment, and so we could be quite confident they weren't going to be studying uh, anything outside of class for a while. And then right at the end of the last class, given this test, okay? And so uh, you've already seen the results, but I want to say, so what, was, what were the principles that this postdoc was designing these class activities around? Well, first I'd say there was no pre-prepared lecture material, so nothing in which the, the, uh, they were prepared to go in and start talking to the students. There were pre-prepared lecture uh, tasks and, you know, for the students to start working on. And these built into these tasks were first thinking about picking examples and problems and presentation to motivate the students to want to learn this. There's lots of research on best ways to do that. Uh, you know, directly looked at what we knew about how students thought about this, this topic, and so uh, tailor and connect up with that confusions they might have, apply what's known, at, well known about how the mind works and learning and processing information. I'll say a little more about that in a minute. And then finally, you know, think of the right kinds of questions and problems to have students work on in class. Uh, and in this case, they used a mixture of both these type of, I talked about before, of clicker questions that the students answer with clickers and talk amongst themselves, and some little worksheet activities where, again, they'd work in small groups working on a problem worksheet. They'd have to write some things out, solving stuff. Um, and then this, you know, focus on making a, a effective feedback. And the, the idea being, you know, the students get some feedback from talking to each other, that really helps, uh, but he, they also, to enhance the feedback, the instructor is busy, you know, wandering around, listening in on those conversations, and therefore getting up, even in a 250 student class, you just sample the groups on the aisle, you get a very, quite an accurate view of what things they're confused by, what they understand, and so on, and therefore you're much better poised to give them effective uh, feedback after they've worked on something. So, so, you know, building these tasks with those ideas in mind and, and executing them are what gives this kind of uh, differences in learning that takes place in the classroom. One of the things I like to particularly uh, this shows particularly well, and I, I want to emphasize, we've, it has been seen in other research, but uh, is how this addresses the question that lots of people have of, you know, does this kind of teaching just work for the, you know, the struggling students, or does it work for the, the top students as well, or vice versa? And, you know, this is clear that this entire distribution has moved up dramatically. And so this really makes the case that, 
you know, this type of teaching is more effective for every student who has a human brain, um, which is usually the vast majority. Um, <laughs> And that's what the research would say. We're not talking about principles that come out of just struggling students. We're talking about principles of how the brain learns and why this is uh, effective. Uh, I'll just also mention for, you know, a selling point for faculty, not too surprising if you think about it, we measured engagement in these classes too. And the engagement was dramatically higher uh, in the uh, interactive class. Okay, so I'm just going to wrap up here with, uh, finish with, I want to give uh, sort of a takeaway uh, to faculty who may be not so familiar with these things and, and so on, uh, some three cases that you can walk out and use in your courses tomorrow, okay? Now, if you've been using all this stuff, you, you probably already have this, but I'm hoping that some of you you know, won't just walk out and say, gee, that data is pretty compelling, but of course I don't know what to do. There, here's some things you could do, okay? So I'm going to give three particular straightforward examples that really embody these basic principles. So the first is thinking about the homework and exam problems that you give and, and what they're doing in terms of giving practice and assessment of expert thinking, okay? So, if I sort of go back and think about, here's a, here's a set of some basic, uh, really universal uh, aspects across science and, and engineering, certainly, of, uh, of expertise in the discipline. So, you know, a, a set of consistent concepts and mental models and criteria for which of those you want to use. Uh, ability to recognize relevant and irrelevant information to solve the problem and know what information's needed to solve a problem like this. Uh, knowing and having criteria for deciding that an answer is, is correct or not. And the process, like the, the, the process of you know, model development and use, having these set of models, but understanding how to refine and, and adopt these into new situations. And then finally, every field has a particular set of specialized representations, which experts then move between them, and it's a great help to understanding and solving problems, okay? So just that's just a reminder of key components of expertise. And now I'm going to look at the typical homework problem that is, you know, any textbook, the back of the, you know, chapter homework problems. First, they will always provide all the information needed and only the information needed to solve the problem. And if there's approximation, simplification, you know, neglect friction or air resistance and so on, they clearly say that. And then you know, exams all say that. So you think about that, well, okay, so that just wiped out any opportunity for students to ever learn about or you to assess them on those particular components of expertise. Um, you know, typically they're just supposed to get an answer. There's not any question requiring justify why that answer is reasonable or come up with criteria for why that answer is reasonable, so that one goes away. Um, only calling, you know, usually only call for one representation, so that goes away. And finally, the, the nature of the problems are very often such that a student can, can really just memorize the procedure without any understanding the underlying model and concepts, but because they you know, they memorize a procedure and they know this applies to chapter five problems and you immediately just give them chapter five problems and on the exam only test them on chapter five problems. You know, they can recognize these surface features and just apply those procedures kind of mindlessly but quite effectively. They do well in the home, on the exams and so on, uh, but are, are, have no expertise means that if they're given a new context, they're completely hopeless at uh, doing anything useful. But, so that rep wipes out those different components of expertise. So the message to you is go back and think about the homework and exam problems you're giving 
and by the way, think about the homework problems first before putting all these things on the exam when students have never seen them before. Okay, but of, of okay, how do, you, how do you design better problems that really embody these elements of expertise? Because that's gonna help students uh, learn better. Uh, next thing is, is just paying attention to how the memory works in the brain. Uh, so very quickly, the slightly simplified version, uh, memory can be thought of as, as having two components. There's the, the long-term memory, which is what most of us think about as memory. It has this enormous capacity and, obviously, and you know, retains things for years, decades. Uh, but then there's the short-term working memory. This is the sort of way the mind works for remembering and processing things on short time scales, uh, namely things like in a, in a classroom situation. And that short-term memory is nicely represented by this Gary Larson cartoon. It has a very limited capacity. And in fact, the, the research shows it's the typical human brain can basically uh, remember and process something like five to seven distinct new items, um, where a new item is something that's not in long-term memory. And um, it's also important to realize that, that this is not just a memory, it's kind of more like a CPU, that it both, it's, if you give it more th a new items to keep track of, it bogs down its whole processing, and so it can't really process and learn those things as well. And so, you know, if you think about, and or if you ever sit in on a, on a lecture outside your discipline, you realize that this is a tiny number of new things compared to what's presented in a, in a normal science lecture. Um, and so anything you can do to reduce these demands on, on working memory will actually help students learn. And so, you know, when you think about that common, you know, technical term that you always use and makes it easier to talk about, you really need to be thinking about, though, is that really, you know, one-sixth of what I want students to get from today's class? Because if it isn't, you better leave it out. Let them go learn it outside of class when you don't have the same time limitations and therefore it doesn't have such significance. Um, and so, you know, it's also true for that interesting little, uh, you know, side tidbit or detail. Anything that requires cognitive processing has a real cost in what the, the students can learn and so you need to take that into account. The other thing you can do in this regard that helps a lot, there's many others, but um, if you are much more explicit than is usually done to show students how the different uh, ideas you're working with are connected, okay, and so that, that ends up in their brain rather than living as these sort of separate, isolated independent things that take up more working memory, they can see, oh, that's sort of different aspects of one single thing, consolidating them then frees up working memory to, to learn uh, other things, okay? Uh, in that spirit, since you all have working memories and I am seriously, uh, quest, you know, running up a limit here that I probably exceeded, I'll make sure somebody has copies of my slides that are uh, easily available if you want them. Okay, so finally the last thing is just giving you the, think about the benefits to, you know, lecture in just, just assuming you're not using clickers or anything, you've been using lectures, but just to realize the benefits of just stopping class for once and giving some challenging conceptual question to the students to, to sit there and talk about, okay? So, um, it, it, first, it's not that important that they can actually answer it. In fact, it might be good if they couldn't. There's some reason to believe. But it just has to be something they can get seriously engaged with. And if that happens, first, it gives them a chance to sort of br a break in the vast flood of information. They can sort of talk, as they're talking through, consolidate, organize their their thoughts that, you know, kind of freeze up working memory. They can get 
from each other some immediate feedback, you know, for the students who have completely lost what the last 10 minutes were about because they couldn't remember what mitosis is. Now they have an opportunity and the student next to them can tell them and then suddenly they, things can start to make sense. So that's an immediate benefit. And you know, they're now talking, arguing through the reasons. Their brains are processing more. Uh, but it also turns out that people learn vastly more if they've been primed to learn. So if they've been struggling with a question uh, you know, and a problem and then you're going to explain how to do it, they learn enormously more than if you give them the explanation before they ever know what the question or problem is. Uh, but finally, and the one I want to emphasize the most, is that you get to listen in on those conversations. And so you'll get so much better idea about what they understand and therefore what you should follow up and talk about than you ever could if you just continued uh, through your lecture. So, uh, so, you know, there's really, it's a very simple thing to do as a starting point and you get a large immediate benefits. Okay, so uh, with that, I'll just end here. We have a bunch of time for questions and discussion and, you know, just give you this, this vision, which I think the Simon Initiative is really uh, a perfect match for really thinking about science and engineering, uh, teaching and learning as a science, as a research discipline, and it needs to be, you know, a lot, you know, make this more like astronomy instead of astrology, which is why, well, unfortunately, much of our teaching practices uh, have developed. And so, uh, I'll make sure the slides are available, and here are a bunch of references on implementation things and learning more about this subject. So, thank you.